Welcome to this seminar in the Bergen School of Global Studies. My name is Björn Enge Bertelsen, and I am the leader of the Global Research Program on Inequality at the University of Bergen. Now, some of you may know what the Bergen School of Global Studies, BSGS for short, is, and I think that is very good, but I will tell you more about it now for those of you who do not know. The BSGS is a new initiative at the University of Bergen to really showcase global challenges and the courses, teaching, and also the research available at the University of Bergen. The whole aim of the BSGS is to be a framework for not only cataloging the many BA, MA, and PhD courses we have in the field of global challenges, but also to provide an arena for cross-disciplinary collaboration including the development of new courses and initiatives. I think we can all agree that in an era of a global pandemic and a sustained climate change crisis, we really need as researchers, students and citizens of the world to be relating more globally to knowledge. The BSGS has taken the consequence of this and has selected five pillars as a way to organize what UID has to offer currently and in the future. These are climate change, governance, health, migration, and inequality. And all pillars are led by engaged researchers in their respective fields. So do check out our website at UID slash BSGS. I have as the director of the Global Research Programme on Inequality, GRIP, I'm sorry, another acronym for you, mm -hmm. uh, the great privilege of leading the inequality pillar of BSGS. As a research programme, GRIP is fundamentally collaborative and we seek both to understand and engage complex forms of inequalities. Crucially, in our research and uh, activities, we work to reflect multiple human perceptions and worldviews, and by including what is often and perhaps a bit glibly been called theories from the South or global epistemologies. By working towards inclusion of also global perspectives, uh, we believe we have a better chance to more comprehensively map dynamics of inequality. As we're all aware, in changing global circumstances, various forms of inequalities coexist and intersect. Moreover, such concerns about the changing forms of inequality have become even more acute during the current pandemic. For an increasing amount of knowledge has established that inequality is multidimensional and it represents a complex challenge to human development prosperity and well-being, however we may define those. Research has also suggested that inequalities in wealth, knowledges, lifespan, or geographies, for instance, may actually be increasing rather than be being reduced. This is something we have also seen quite clearly during the last decades, I think. In such a dire global context with increasing climate change, at GRIP, we approach inequality as irreducible to socioeconomic indicators alone. It does not mean that we disregard economic indicators, but that inequality is irreducible to those. Instead, we propose to understand inequality through relating a number of domains. In other words, seeing inequalities as inextricably connected, as constantly changing, and as globally irrelevant. In working globally, GRIP acknowledges and engages the importance of the Southern Hemisphere and its vast and emerging bodies of research, knowledge, and positions. Now, due to our work at GRIP, I am extremely honored to be welcoming you also to this film screening and discussion of a hugely important topic, namely the challenges of gender discrimination, gender bias, and further diversity at research institutions and universities. The film that we have just seen delves into all of this, uh, all of these issues in deeply important and sometimes quite painful ways. The importance of gender and other forms of discrimination within science for inequality should be clear, but I will quote the filmmakers here as they state this very um, well. I quote, 
science benefits from diversity. Science benefits from having a diversity of perspectives from people with different economic and cultural backgrounds. I think I was not the only one that was deeply moved on a personal level when seeing this documentary for the first time. There are many reasons for this that I hope we will also discuss. For one, it is a really powerful film that puts the finger in the wound, exposing a range of ways in which women, and even more, women of color are systematically marginalized, discriminated against, bullied, and sexually harassed in academia. And it does so, I think, in a beautiful way by not portraying female scientists as the victims. Instead, it shows their research and the research environment, their dedication to science, their contribution to pushing the boundaries of our knowledge. And only in that context does it proceed to show the many ways in which these women have been discriminated against. Second, it is also a film that lays bare that these are insidious dynamics and mechanisms that do not necessarily occur at the margins of academia, at less well-known institutions, or as exercised by only a few male academics. Now, the film documents that this occurs at highly prestigious North American institutions, such as Harvard and MIT, and that women in these institutions have needed battle also. The film, therefore, is important as it does not only point to individual predatory male academics, but also shows, I would suggest, a system of patriarchal power which marginalizes women. This is also exemplified in the film when one anonymized and aspiring female scientist brought the complaint against Dave Marchant, only to be told by the female head of administration that the only one making the that the one making the complaint should be quiet, as Marchant was valid. Third, through the use of data and reports, the film meticulously documents that 50% of women in science, technology, and engineering and mathematics in STEM, another angle has experienced sexual harassment. This is an enormously high number, which undoubtedly contributes to the so called leaky pipeline problem in these sciences with less and less women continuing on from the BA level to the faculty level. This is therefore another example of a structural problem inherent to this. Or it does not stop at what it calls the tip of the iceberg, namely sexual, namely sexual harassment and other more or less open forms of discrimination or assault. Instead, it documents everything from differences in salaries between male and female professors to how lab space is allocated according to gender. Moreover, it attempts to document how women are exposed to a number of practices that are like a thousand small cuts. To name some, these are to be left out of the not to be invited to be exposed to vulgar name calling. To having one's competence question. I will stop there as I will not be the one that will do most of the talking today, although it has seemed like this until now, <laughs> as I have an extremely competent and engaged group of scholars with me, and let me present them. To my extreme right. I have uh, Lisa Wagner, uh, she's a professor at the Department of Comparative Politics at UIT, and for several decades, Lisa has done research particularly on democratization, gender, sexual health, and Lisa has also led a large number of research projects, and is also the co-director of the School of Public Studies. So, welcome. Ragnel Murios, to my near right, not extreme right, is also a professor at the Department of Comparative Politics at UIB. Ragnar is also the Vice Dean of Research at the Faculty of Social Sciences, and among a range of other issues, has done comparative research on gender and election and voting patterns and financing. So welcome to you. Last but not least, we have a representative from STEM, 
and Dorothy Jane Bankel. She's a researcher at the Department of Biological Sciences at UIP. Dorothy has worked extensively on natural resource management, especially in the sea. She's also heavily engaged in cross-disciplinary work, sustainability, and science policy interface problems, as well as the whole field of gender and science. So welcome to all of you. Thank you, Jira. Thank you, Bjorn. I thought we could start off with a quick round where all of you reflect a bit uh, on the relevance of this documentary for our understanding of gendered forms of discrimination in academia. Well, the film focuses on STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the North American contexts. So are the findings in the film transferable to other disciplines and other contexts? Dorothy, would you like to go first on this one? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, yeah, the an quick answer is yes. <laughs> this is uh, not just a STEM issue, although this uh, movie puts the focus on STEM for, for very good reasons. Um, if you think about a lot of our innovations in our society are coming from engineering and science and technology, um, this is, it's really important that there is representation in the sciences yeah, uh, and this movie, I just um, want to say this documentary film, uh, and I'm giving my personal opinion, is, a, is very beautifully made because it, it lays down so many of the complex layers, and uh, you alluded to this kind of, you know, death by thousand cuts, mm -hmm. uh, that's the tip of the iceberg being a really um, relevant metaphor for how women in science are able to shake things off because yeah, well, it's not illegal. It's not criminal to do this. I mean, uh, who are you going to go to the police or who are the police? I, I just want to do science. Um, and I just wanted to share that this uh, film, it was a Bergen International Film Festival that brought it to my attention um, this, uh, this past, because um, it just came out uh, last summer in, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, it changed my career because it showed me um, how I could act on this kind of inherent internalized activism that I always knew I had. Mm -hmm. And to see people like Nancy Hopkins at the end of the film say, you know what? I'm not sure if I would do this again. Mm. Man, I, that got me saying, you know what? I'm gonna show Nancy why that was so, that MIT report was so important. And then in my realization, I'm, I'm a researcher who also does research on research natural scientist uh, learning a lot of social science and humanities techniques, I realized early or you know, maybe 10 years ago in my career, I needed social science and humanities philosophy of science to understand biology, to understand my own science and working with responsible research innovation and the sustainable development goals, SDG five and SDG 10, you know, gender equality and uh, minimize uh, in inequalities. This is like, okay, listen, this film made me realize this is part of my science mm -hmm. and I want to be part of that activism. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dorothy. And before mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I ask Daniel and Lisa uh, to comment, we also have an audience with us today, a live physical <laughs> audience behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we also have an enormous so we invite both the physical audience and the digital audience to both the Yeah, and I think this, uh, yeah, I think the movie is really important. And also one factor that I think is we need to understand is that academics are international. So it's not just something that happens at uh, Harvard, Harvard or MIT, because everyone who is actually at well, not everyone, but most of those who are actually at the MIT or Harvard, they didn't start their career there. They started their career somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And even if we think uh, such a thing that in Norway or at the University of Bergen, there is no such thing as discrimination on the basis of gender, we do all have international careers. Mm -hmm. So if there is harassment at conferences, you can experience that, or there is something, uh, or there is bias when you submit uh, a manuscript for instance, that happens to all of us because our careers are international. <laughs> so I think that's a really important factor. Uh, so it, and, but of course, questions of how easy it travels. Uh, I think this, 
the movie is, as you've said, very important because it says something about different types of harassment that you can experience. Uh, and I think that's valid all across um, the different disciplines. But then there is also, of course, something to do with the importance, I think, in STEM of having um, of these larger projects uh, that in other disciplines, maybe you can actually have a much more autonomous career so, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. So you're not so dependable on the project leaders. So you can, so that's, but it's kind of still the same and it's also changing within the social sciences, for instance. Mm -hmm. You do have more the use of networks. And it's also, of course, no matter if your career is uh, very autonomous and independent, you need to have someone pointing to you saying, you're brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, and that I think uh, we've seen research on that. It's more likely that men are pointed out as brilliant than women, women scholars mm -hmm. um, in different uh, mm -hmm. subdisciplines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? So thank you. And, and I just love here listening to you speaking. So this film spoke to me on so many different levels because it was like, kind of seeing myself in, in you know, in, in, through different phases of my career, mm -hmm. you know, being young mm -hmm. and like things sort of in, inappropriate advances while in the field, you know, like, uh, okay. So I studied trade unions in Africa and it was a very, most people working in trade unions were men. And, you know, when I was doing, everyone was going out on Friday nights. So, you know, what, you know, what was inappropriate, you know, and then, could I dance with these guys? And, you know, and it was always finding that balance and I had to find it myself. Mm. And it was always this like, you know, be finding your balance. And suddenly I wasn't a researcher. I was young and I was a woman. And, and, and this is some, you know, I always felt like if I, that sort of created an additional handicap of it. And, mm. and I was too young to have a vocabulary for it. You know, not like, and coming now as a, you know, <laughs> This doesn't happen to me anymore. Put it that way, but but <laughs> unfortunately, but no. But but the, the thing is, so I just wish I'd had somebody there to say to me, "Listen, you don't have to put up with that." Mm -hmm. And and I think that's something I saw through this film. All the women and all the stories, they started out alone. They started out grappling with these issues on their own, mm -hmm. thinking, kind of internalizing the issues that they were grappling with, thinking. I've got to deal with this myself, either because you know nobody would think this is a problem, and but also because nobody saw it. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, I think this not being seen is something a lot of young women in the sciences have felt. And so that was that was my mm -hmm. first reaction. And the second one was that I felt kind of like you. This film was really kind of a wow factor because it helped me gain a vocabulary because I think a lot of the problem with my own experience of gender in in science and I can tell you there is there is gender in science there is gender in science in Bergen there is gender in science in Africa there is gender in science in the U.S. so you know this is international the problem is that it's very difficult to find a proper vocabulary I could say oh that is gendered and then, what do you mean? Give me examples. Mm. And then, you know, you try to sort of operationalize and come up with examples. Of, and then the discussion moves. Oh, yeah, but that was because of that. And that was because of that. And then, you know, it, the gender disappears. And this is this happens, I always find, to actually have a proper vocabulary mm. to, you know, to address gender and gender uh, differences. And this is why I thought, for me, that was, this mm. film was super helpful. Mm especially, you know, the topic of sexual harassment. I mean, getting that list of, because, and all the nine different layers mm. under the iceberg. Mm. To me, that was, that was a revelation. So, you know, it was, yeah, this was an eye opener. Thank you. No, I think, I think you, you, you're all right and you all make uh, very uh, valid points. And I think that this, this is one of the big accomplishments of mm. the film. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, because it's easy to talk about sort of open sexual harassment. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the, the example of this sort of old 
pathetic geology professor who sort of tries to pass the keys around, you know? That's, that's easy, mm. that's easy. But mm. I mean, there are underlying structural problems there, mm. yeah? the thousands of wall cuts that mm. also mm. Dorothy uh, commented on. And I was wondering, I mean, what can, and, and it points to this being a structural problem, not mm. just an individual problem mm. or, or these lone male predator mm -hmm. uh, issues. So being a structural problem, what can or what should universities as institutions do and have they done enough, in a sense, to address this? Mm -hmm. Dorothy. So we uh, have an issue <clears throat> at our faculty of uh, mathematics and natural sciences, and that is this statistic where 15% of our professors are female. So uh, we even at our medical faculty here at UIB, we see that 40% of professors are female. So what's going on at our faculty at UIB to make this a number consistently low, even though this has been on the agenda for several years? So uh, this is another thing that the film, I, I think is, it's a very pedagogical film. I think we realize mm -hmm. that when we see it and it's very fair and it's very calm and it's not hysteric and it's very emotional. And, uh, we, um, so after I s uh, saw this film first um, with Biff, uh, Bergen International Film Festival, I wanted to kind of follow the model of Nancy Hopkins and get this kind of critical mm. mass of people who, who mm -hmm. are nodding to this film and say, yeah, this is an issue also here locally. Um, so we have these uh, 17 ambassadors at our faculty where we've tried to kind of break down how can we t use the film as a uh, discussion opener, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going really well. Uh, UIB, I think, is uh, going to soon uh, buy the rights to the film and text it in the region. Uh, we have a network around it with NTNU and Oslo mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to show this, mm -hmm. to use this. Mm -hmm as a door opener, because if you see who saw this film at Biff and who is watching it, it's other females, <laughs> right? So we have to get these discussions in little, if you will, safe spaces where we know each other. And, and that is the example that Jane uh, Willenbrink shows with her colleague, Adam Lewis. It wasn't until she put something on paper that he made that realization. Yeah, I, I, now I see it. Now I see the bigger mm -hmm. picture. I'm going to write under it. It wasn't until Nancy Hopkins put something on paper to, to show another colleague that she was like, yep, yep, <laughs> I want to sign that. I don't just want to approve it. I want to put my name under that. And that's, again, that kind of the scout uh, before the troops scouting it out. Do we think that this is an issue with us locally? Yes. Okay, let's get that critical mass and go forward. So we have a project now called Gender Act at Mothnot, mm -hmm. where we're working both at the top level, like leadership programs mm -hmm. and mentoring and that, but lokale uh, balance so the local um, equity and gender balance work at mm -hmm. the PhD, postdoc, mm -hmm. um, first time everyone says, locally and using the film as a discussion um, opener there. Mm -hmm. Great. I uh, think, uh, yeah, I so, I, so I think this is, it becomes kind of even more complicated when you move sort of to a social science setting where we have more women students and, you know, and, you know, we do really well for a while. And then it's clearly that there is a, you know, there's this pipe piping, leaking pipe or the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And there is something along the way where we leak women, you know, where women disappear or, you know, they just don't. And, and I think part of the problem is that we don't address the whole line. We, mm -hmm. we go into where, you know, okay, suddenly the problem is a postdoc level or, whatever, or professor mm -hmm. level. But I think we need to sort of look at the whole line of, uh, of, you know, of entry points. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I've been doing, for instance, is noticing how women in the classroom raise their hand much more seldomly, actually 10% of the time in, you know, in, in introductory classes. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you kind of wonder, why is that? Women are the most, I mean, women students are, you know, they have better grades. In high school, they talk a lot. And, and you know, what happens mm -hmm. when you move to university? And I think, you know, just sort of addressing these issues from, you know, from the word go and, and look at the different levels and to, just to have, to have an agenda and to have a language and a vocabulary to address gender and race differences along the yeah. way. Yeah. And just each and every, you know, just sort of have this as a program mm. and just don't just come in. Oh, suddenly we have a problem. 
we only have 10% professors. Well, you know what? Let's look at the whole issue here and, mm -hmm. and do it sort of on a constant level, mm -hmm. not just sort of come in to solve a crisis. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I think that's what you, in yeah. a sense, that's also what you're addressing. Mm -hmm. I think it's super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. I have a question from the audience but first. Uh, yeah, and I think one kind of interesting uh, change that is possible to do that is done within the, uh, in the gender and politics uh, literature is to actually switch the language because you were saying that just 15% women. Mm -hmm. And if you think about 30% women, you can think about, okay, but that's not so bad. But if you switch it and then you say 85% men yeah. and you switch <laughs> it to 70% of men, Mm. Then it's kind of then tough people start to think that well that's bad you know mm. that's mm. something mm -hmm. so I think that's kind of an easy thing to do kind of switching the language yeah not just kind of giving the percentage of, of how many women but actually how many or the mm. other representative mm. gender is kind of it's just a small twist, mm. and, twist. Mm. and then just to be short I think that we need to to speak up more often uh, we don't necessarily have to say that. So if you are in a, a committee uh, when you're discussing the qualifications of someone, mm. uh, actually saying that, you know, I, if you think that maybe there is a, a slight chance that someone are, there is a bias against someone mm. and you're thinking maybe I think this person is good. Why aren't the other ones not talking about this person? Yeah. yeah. Try to kind of speak up speak and up. say, you know, I, I, why, you know, this mm. person, why not this person? Mm. Because I think so easily, maybe this has got something to do with, competence that we are so afraid of showing that uh, we don't really are not competent enough to do the mm. conflict to kind of as, have the assessments of other people's uh, skills mm. so we so easily kind of talked along with others saying that oh yeah 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 okay we don't kind of speak up I think mm. often enough mm. when we see things happen uh, I know there is a question and I know there is a comment before that, since you're the vice dean for research at the Faculty of Social Science, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to follow up a bit. Do you think that we should, at the university uh, in Bergen and elsewhere, experiment more with uh, anonymized and gender neutral applications? I mean, so we evade the problem of seeing the background and the, and, uh, the gender of, of, of applicants, or is that just you know postponing the problem in a sense mm -hmm. because that's a very sort of direct and practical way to 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 an attempt at least to to circumvent uh, gender bias i think of course we could try i think it it would be a way of uh, go around that but I, practically i think it would be difficult because especially now we're so used to uh, googling people and doing those things so it would be difficult to think that someone is not checking on, like, who is this? Mm -hmm. um, so, but of course, it's a, but that's another thing that I've seen also as a, the wise thing that we do have these different levels. And it's, I think that the different levels of the university needs to speak together and have, and have a similar agenda. <laughs> and that's really hard. So in some universities, you would see a really progressive, uh, for instance, uh, rector or someone wanting mm. to do change, but you know, those on the ground are saying, we don't mm. want those, who, what are you doing? Mm. You know, why mm. should we do this? Mm. Mm. And in other places, there would be people on the ground saying we need to do this, but you know, it doesn't really have support at the different levels. Mm. So I think mm. that this really complex university structure that we have makes it really difficult mm. to have policies that work on all level and mm. making people agree. Mm. that this is something that we need to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you have 85% male professors, then people are thinking, oh, that's a bit bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Dorothy? Yeah, I comment? just wanted to comment on um, language uh, quite quickly. And you mentioned um, leaky pipeline is often this often used metaphor. But you also said, Lisa, something I wanted to pick up on is that there's so many different routes in science. Mm -hmm. And uh, some linguistic critics have said, you know, the leaky pipeline is just reducing women to these drops of water that are just mm -hmm. falling out of the pipeline. And uh, surely there's a better way to show this. And also the leaky pipeline uh, you can really say, you know, is there just one track of science mm -hmm. and that you have to follow that? And because then you see, you know, the a four uh, white male hetero that looks like this, that's the only way to get there. Also the leaky pipeline insinuates that it's a quick fix. 
everyone mm. anyone can get their pipe yeah. fixed and it's mm. a it's a male plumber that's mm. going to come to your house mm. and fix it for you so mm. instead there's a really i tweeted this a couple of days ago there's this really good essay talking about the braided river system this comes from natural ecology showing that science when we're really trying to have diverse science diverse innovations to really help with the global challenges we need to recognize the different entry points and the web of networks between for example science industry um diversity um sexual orientation ethnic background and all these things to have robust good technologies and so anyway this linguistic mm. the metaphor i think when we can base it more on how nature works and biodiversity is a strength and all this type of thing we get past these engineering paradigms like leaky pipeline mm. so. i think that's a very helpful change of metaphor at least in this climate change mm. era. i think that's a great point but you have a question but I have maybe a... we can follow up on this good I... uh, <laughs> see. Thank you. So, Siri Gloppen, uh, it might not be so much a question as a comment. It's been amazing listening to you, and I really also found the, the documentary super helpful in getting sort of vague thoughts sorted. But I want to pick up on a couple of things that you were saying. So, I agree with you, Ragnhild, that I think that things in, uh, the, I mean, we're looking at structural problems, and in some ways, they're getting worse. I think culturally and in terms of attention, they're getting better. We're, we're putting more attention on it than we see the problem, but structurally it's getting worse. And I would say that there are at least two things that make it worse. So one thing is that we have we're gone to a grading, grading system that really makes it difficult to stand out. I would never have become a professor if, it, if I had been a student in this system, because the only reason why somebody said you're brilliant was because I had a very good grade and that you can't really do in the same way anymore. And that I think means makes you much more dependent on, on uh, people seeing you had already, giving you good references, good recommendations, picking you up for mentoring and so on. So I think the much more informal system that we move to with this much, much coarser grading scale is not a good thing for women in academia. And we need to discuss that and we need to think about it. The other thing is that a lot of people are come much more, more people are coming in as under the wings of big professors with big projects. So you do your PhD mm. and your postdoc <laughs> under, these, uh, under these wings, which makes it much more difficult to have an independent career, whether you're a man or a woman. Yeah. And I think that is also not good if you want to have, uh, have a, an independent career. So we need to talk about these big, heavy structures that are changing science, mm. and also that come from the natural sciences and into the social sciences, where these big projects don't necessarily make sense in the same way. So I think that's something we need to talk about. And I also want to, uh, to address something that you said, Bjorn, you said maybe if we sort of put on a blindfold and we can judge everyone without knowing the gender, then we really, really forget. And I think you were talking a little bit about that also, Dorothy, that the criteria are also gendered. So a lot of things that because of the, the academic culture, women do a lot of their unpaid work also in academia. We do a lot of the housekeeping and sitting. And then also because of gender attention to gender differences, we do a lot more work sitting on committees of all kinds and on all kinds of uh, sort of we take on roles because the, because we need to be there, but that also takes off time. So I think this idea of we actually take the time you take off, not only to answer all these emails in a kinder way, but also to, to fill the roles are, are very invisible. So I think we also need to discuss the criteria and the way in which they are gendered. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if I could just uh, respond quickly. My, uh, my question to uh, Ragnar about sort of uh, anonymizing these uh, applications were more to to hear uh, her thinking about this from an institutional perspective mm -hmm. and not a, uh, a suggestion <laughs> I, I of course uh, see this mm -hmm. as a kind of a problematic neoliberal quick fix yeah, mm -hmm. that, that eclipses in mm -hmm. very insidious ways the kind of structural mm -hmm. uh, inequalities that underlie this problem mm -hmm. but I mean it's it's important to discuss it yeah because it is a kind of a 
it's a suggestion that is now floated in many kind of uh, contexts. Mm. But I think just to yes, follow please. up, because I think what there's kind of a there's a good line in this uh, discussion, because I think, you know, uh, addressing, you know, it's just you're saying it's just not one way. And so and, and that's why you were challenging this sort of plumbing, mm. <laughs> the, the plumbing. And, and I do agree. But I also kind of want to challenge that because to a certain extent, there are not that many ways in. And I think, and this is where I really want to agree with Siri, there is a kind of a, there is, there is an informal, there is a very, you know, the criteria are set. We don't really, they're not, not necessarily written down in like in, in, in scriptures, but, but they are quite set and they are quite made. And, and it is, um, and, and, and that actually complicates matters. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is, uh, so, okay. So for instance, in, uh, in, in my experience, we could have a work meeting and then it, it ends and then suddenly all the guys go for a beer and I'm not invited. It's not because they don't like me. Well, but, but I know that it's just the map and they bring male students with them. They don't bring the women students because and I think they may have wanted to, but you know, they, they're afraid of the rumors. But so this becomes a very male club. Yeah. It's very small. It's not a big issue, but it is a kind of an issue where I'm excluded because you know, they just, I don't know if they're too shy to ask me if they just don't, they've never thought of it. And, and they always they ask, no, they are, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but they don't ask, they don't, and they don't ask their female students. So should I go to a wine bar and bring the women? You know, this is kind of, yeah. I've, I've been thinking about this. Like, should I sort of emulate the kind of mm. informal ways of academia that sort of men have kind of uh, sort of uh, sort of purified in a sense for, for centuries and just kind of create my own sort of female thing? That doesn't bring, that doesn't sound right either, right? But so, but you're right, Siri, they are, this is very gendered. And, yeah. and so I, I don't know, I wish there were many ways in, but I'm not so sure. And then I just really want to second, we need, oh, we need formalization. We need formal structures, formal rules, formal meetings, formal everything. Mm -hmm. Because women seek formal rules mm -hmm. and they have a hard time finding the informal ways. It, so I, I, I just think, and that's part of the problem. It's, there's too much informality and we need, we need to, we need, well, you know, I'm starting to love rules. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Late this in is, life. Uh, this this is, is something that came late in life. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, reminds me of David Fletcher's book, How I, How I Learned to Love the Bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that That's me. That's me. <laughs> no, I was just going to actually make a very similar point. But mm -hmm. I think that women just need formal rules mm -hmm. that we actually need mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to know uh, what to do to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. Although that might not be what we actually, or the other thing we need to do to get there mm. but at least we need to do that so we need mm. to kind of and which is because i i think uh, informal rules are really difficult it's difficult to know mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. to be on the right platforms to mm -hmm. actually do mm -hmm. the right mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and i think it's it's better to at least you know know what you're supposed to do uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed in the opening credits yes they talk about the playbook mm -hmm. uh, so yes. there's this playbook yeah. and mm -hmm. i'm just feeling my way through this game mm -hmm. One, and we've uh, we've talked about this in, in the Gender Act uh, project, so I'm in the resource group there. It's a, I, And I love, it's very uh, therapeutic to be in this mm -hmm. project where we get to actually formalize the discussions here and that we're not just doing it after hours, right? It's part of our mm -hmm. time. And, uh, you know, we have OMS, so Health Environment Safety, uh, mm -hmm. that's institutionalized. Mm -hmm. We're going to make gender and diversity discussions part of or HOMS at Mothnot as part of our uh, example of how you can have concrete actions. Because why don't we talk about this at a department level every every year uh, and formalize it just as we do safety? Very good. We have a question from mm -hmm. the digital audience, mm -hmm. I think, but I will now try to um, mm -hmm. tell you all about it. Um, mm -hmm. This is the problem of bystanders. And we remember from the film that, mm -hmm. uh, that one of the Adam Lewis. Mm -hmm. Yes, Adam Lewis, but I forget his maybe next question. Antarctica, first Antarctica, who's working? Jan. Jan. Mm -hmm. 
Jane. Jane. Uh, Jane. 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 Yeah. Jane. And he witnessed the harassment of her for a long period while they were at Cleveland, but mm -hmm. he did not do anything. So, and you've already touched upon it a bit, but how, what are the reasons for what could be called the, uh, the bystander apathy uh, mm -hmm. silence? And how can we address it? I mean, we, we, this is so funny because that was the discussion we started before, you know, before we uh, Dorothy went straight into that. And I think we have three kind of different uh, takes on this. I, you know, I my first thing he said, I knew he was a dick. You know, he, I, I, he that he he did he acknowledged all the way that this guy was behaving in in a really bad way, and I kept thinking. He was also a grad student, so I mean, it wasn't that easy for him to stand up and say, but, but what if he said to her, listen, I don't like you either. I mean, I, I see what you are, I see what you're experiencing. I don't, I wouldn't expect him to stand up to the necessary, to the professor. But he, I'm playing with thought, what if he had just said that? What, what, how, what would that, that have done to her? Maybe she would have been able to go to the bathroom, you know? <laughs> So, so that was my thinking. Just that little thing. Yeah. But you no, had a different I, take. I, I um I really appreciate this film, for, of course, for many reasons. One of them being that uh, Jane Willenbring is so honest in 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 the, her story, right? I mean, just these little things like that going key. I mean, how like personal is that? And that she missed, and she still has chronic bladder problems. That really, I think, helps anchor this story. That this. This really is a true story that is impactful. And then I, um, I want to talk about Adam Lewis and Bob Brown very briefly because I think Adam Lewis is just a godsend in his honesty because we realize in, through the narrative of the film, if he hadn't uh, supported Jake in this, you know, 17 years after the fact, it's not, um, I don't know if it's likely that her Title IX complaint would have gone through and taken the path it had because having that witness um, really to co uh, cooperate mm -hmm. her story was really important for that Title IX complaint. And then I just want to bring up um, Bob Brown, because uh, if uh, people who are very um, uh, good uh, listeners and viewers of the film will realize that twist at the end of Bob Brown, mm -hmm. who was a provost at mm -hmm. MIT when mm -hmm. Nancy Hopkins mm -hmm. delivered that, mm -hmm. who then becomes president of Boston College, mm -hmm denies his, his his own faculty said okay let's let, mm -hmm. let Marshawn come back after a few you know years and a slap on the wrist mm -hmm. he said no mm -hmm. and that is the when I talked to the filmmakers because we've um we've had some really good discussions about this with the filmmakers and with with Jane Willenbring they said that I uh, Bob Brown in the interview wasn't allowed to because it was so preliminary when they're mm -hmm. filming he wasn't allowed to say that so the filmmakers had to after the fact figure out uh, through mm -hmm. <laughs> editing and filmmaking, how to make that twist mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But that is so important because then you see progress with these males that are like, you know what? That is an injustice and I'm gonna right the wrong. Mm -hmm. So what can be done about this? Or, mm -hmm. I wasn't actually going to say what no. was going to be no. done by <laughs> because what I was going to confess is that I'm sometimes a bystander too. So I was wondering why am I that? Because sometimes, and I think that Sometimes I get a bit surprised when these things happen. So if you are places and you think that people shouldn't say things like that, and someone say something like that, mm -hmm. you get a bit shocked. And it mm -hmm. takes some time before you actually get to the point that you're able to answer anything. And you wonder what you're gonna do. And then you go home and then you're lying in your bed and you're thinking, why didn't I say that? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you wonder, should I go back and try to do something? But it's really difficult to be a bystander. And Sometimes um, you just don't, uh, I think that because, especially when it's so nasty like this, mm -hmm. we don't have, we don't expect it to happen. And then it mm -hmm. takes us time to actually react. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having some, and I also think that you need to be uh, almost like trained in questioning and also mm -hmm. trained in thinking that this is inappropriate mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then you're probably also thinking like that if you're in Spielberg and you jumped somewhere, am mm -hmm. I going to start, you know, mm -hmm. questioning my professor? That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, so but what I, can we do? Yeah. I mean, there, there, are, there are many issues there. Of course, I mean, it's, it is more serious if you jump to an Antarctica than that. Yes. 
behaving <laughs> nasty in a similar room, yeah? yeah. You do your faculty. I mean, and you can go a... home to your partner or your friends. Yes. Right? Mm. Uh, but but in the end, it's the same. Fact. Yes, I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, this is something that we identified um, in this project, Gender Act. I, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing <laughs> is um, part of this uh, whole mass, so institutionalizing mm -hmm. this is uh, uh, we're going to do role playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that I've used in my RRI responsible research innovation um, interventions within these interdisciplinary consortiums. Uh, we, we put people in these situations, for example, we're doing an interview and this is uh, for a professor position. Uh, you see one of your colleagues make a very inappropriate question like or something like you know are you gonna planning on have kids or you know or one of these like things that uh, isn't really scientific but you know mm -hmm. and then practice what do you say mm -hmm. like excuse me um you want to maybe rephrase that question or do you is there another a different question rather than exactly that one because i'm i'm not sure if that's really well understood uh or not, just intervening because it is so uncomfortable i we've i think you i thank you for saying that you you've been bystanders we've all been bystanders because it's happening all over the world at any given minute of the day it's about implicit bias we have visions in our head of how society is supposed to work this is uh, influenced us by media um this was well shown in the film why implicit bias matters and that we ha all have a personal but also institutional responsibility to first be aware of the existing and then practicing what to do in these situations so we're using role role in, a little bit of role play for this mm -hmm. and i think that's Something that I've thought that I've maybe been doing wrong a few times is that I've asked the person that uh, I have been uh, attacked uh, mm -hmm. and then I've asked, uh, said things like, I don't think that was, you know, uh, that was appropriate and uh, mm -hmm. do you want me to do something? Mm -hmm. And that person always says no, mm -hmm. uh, because they don't want you to do yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking, okay, so they're fine. I'm mm -hmm. not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it actually, Sometimes we need to act on behalf of others, even though they're saying that it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's an institutional obligation that we do have. Mm -hmm. I think. So. And perhaps we don't really need to uh, to uh, to act on behalf of that person while that person is there either. Yeah? I mean, we can also bring this up in other contexts. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think one of the other. So the one. Okay, so the two things more about this film. So the one of the things that I think in, in, in terms of what to do about it, that's that I also I also felt was really inspiring. It was how it was important to find, you know, a, a cohort or a group yeah. to address these issues. And it's a lot of what you're saying is it's exactly about that. Mm -hmm. Finding, you know, a group kind of a that you can sort of test this vocabulary with and you know share experiences mm -hmm. and and i think that's super important and i think it's really really important that we are able to sort of kind of um communalize mm -hmm. the experiences but the one little thing that i had an issue with about this film and i wonder if you had the same it's like so the issues were always they were kind of solved by a man like in the antarctic the, the title nine wouldn't it happen if she hadn't had that male uh, friend the the guy at the end who uh, you know who Bob turned then, yeah. Bob, who turned this uh, thing over he's like you know in the end there was the, who are the heroes of this story it was the man again <laughs> you know i don't know it, it it's um that was a little bit concerning to me yeah, but i mm. mean it it, it 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 just goes to show i mean uh, rachel burke's point i think mm -hmm. in the in the film mm -hmm. uh, being an african-american being mm -hmm. a female scientist mm -hmm. She said something along the lines of the higher up the ivory tower you go, the whiter and more male and hetero mm -hmm. it becomes. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. And of course, so if you need the university as an institution to solve something, it mm -hmm. will be solved by a man because mm -hmm. there are men higher up, mm -hmm. white men. Mm -hmm. And we certainly recognize that uh, mm -hmm. in the university. Of, of, of mm -hmm. But picking up on her point about the double problems mm -hmm. of being a minority background mm -hmm. uh, female mm -hmm. scientist. I mean, have we, for instance, in the University of Bergen and other universities mm -hmm. in Norway paid too much attention to the male-female uh, 
uh, issue and not paid enough attention to diversity uh, in the broader sense? Or is the problem, the question mis misplaced? I think I think it I think the way you phrase the question becomes a problem in a sense because uh, in all these sort of gender committees that I've been sort of drawn into at the university, it I always feel like it's like okay no we no we really need to talk about sort of the uh, intersectionality we need to talk about uh, racism and so implicitly we've talked enough about the gender diversities yeah. and I think that is the problem that is the implicit if we go, if we want to spend more time talking about you know intersectionalities uh, of inequality and also you know other aspects it is the implicit assumption that we should talk less about mm -hmm. the gender dimension mm -hmm. and I think that is the problem because we shouldn't talk less about uh, gender disparities but we should have we should expand that mm -hmm. discussion and also expand it but also acknowledge that there are elements like you know with you know with when you kind of have a double handicap so to speak mm -hmm. uh, uh where sort of gender and race interfaces mm -hmm. and and i'm going to be very honest and that will be problems that it will be more difficult for me as to resonate with and maybe again i wouldn't maybe like that guy in antarctica i wouldn't i would see it but maybe not yeah. have i i wouldn't pick up on all the signals which again is a problem of lack of diversity of staff, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I just really want to say, yes, we need to be more focused on that, but not at the expense of, you know, it doesn't have to be either or. And I think a lot of the time these discussions are brought up, it becomes a kind of an either or, at least implicitly. So what you're saying is that we should expand our knowledge of and our politics mm -hmm. of the gender and our knowledge of the gender bias into also recognizing Racial bias, cultural mm. bias, as mm. a reflection mm. of mm. our mm. very white. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I. I. Obviously, intersectionality is. Um, it's. 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 In its definition, complex, right? And then you're adding these mm. layers mm. of complexity, and you see. I mean, how many black female Nobel laureates do we have? And one. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so obviously, it's. It's a problem. I, and this can be seen in different ways. For example, so I'm American. I, the fact of the matter is, even though we have a very heavy baggage, racial baggage in, our, um, in the United States today, it was possible for us to elect a black man for, for presidents before a white woman. That's, that's kind of like a, also a, a realization, even though, for example, take Hillary Clinton as a fascinating example, her CV was way longer and more experienced than Barack Obama's ever was. Uh, but so th there is um, something there. I, I, I'm just really proud of our current president who's married to a doctor. Dr. Jill Biden is our first uh, first lady with a PhD and that she's not leaving science and education and she wants to use that role as the first lady also to say you know it's about science and it's about politics and and this and that but um we cannot forget intersectionality and it's it's there and even in norway you know you think of us as like white homogeneous group we're becoming more and more diverse mm -hmm. uh, especially on campus mm -hmm. but are we becoming more diverse? Like, you know, we're, we're all the uh, black Africans on campus. Uh, in my faculty, we have very few, I don't see them. Uh, what are we gonna do about that? What, how do we be more conscious of this issue? Can I raise uh, another issue? I mean, it was not directly uh, addressed in the film, but I mean, across uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, Africa, North America, we now see an increased attack on gender research and critical gender research and feminist thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, how does the kind of backlash against that kind of long trajectory of critical research, which has been very important in raising mm -hmm. issues of, of, of gender marginalization mm -hmm. and gender bias, how does the backlash against that kind of research um, affect our work? Or how do we relate to it? Mm -hmm. Put differently, how important is it mm -hmm. to, to defend uh, the autonomy, mm -hmm. or not autonomy, but the, the, the important role of gender mm -hmm. research? I think this is, a, this is a question when I suddenly feel the uneasiness that Ragnar brought up of, of 
kind of in some instances becoming a bystander. Because so I work a lot in Sweden and with Swedish colleagues, and they've had an enormous debate on, you know, on, on gender sciences, and, and there's been a, a real backlash. And it's I I know and, and what I notice is that this backlash against gender sciences in Sweden is not it's not only addressed, it's very much sort of addressed by male social scientists, but also some women. And I I noticed that I, it's kind of, a, it's a very uneasy debate for me and I, I don't really engage in it. But, and what I mean, like some of the most prominent social science, uh, political scientists in Sweden are very, very aggressively, have been aggressively attacking this, uh, you know, sort of gender science. Mm. And, and I've always felt like I should address it more. And, and this is why I feel like a bystander. Mm. So I don't know you you I don't know how you feel about this debate because you you know this you know this debate almost as well as well as I do. Yes, mm. no. Um, mm. Of course, it's it's a, it's a huge problem that you you. Mm. So one thing, so you can also be harassed for for what you're studying, and also mm. sometimes mm -hmm. it, it gets uh, you can get uh, threats. We have I don't think we've seen it so much that like physical threats in, in Norway, uh, mm -hmm. but in other. Mm -hmm. Of course, in, in several countries mm. in the Eastern Europe and mm. uh, elsewhere. Um, so it is. So it is really dramatic in the, the other. Yeah. So it's and I think we could, of course need to be focused on that and uh, make sure that uh, standing up and saying that research should be safe uh, no matter mm. what you research. Mm. And um, but there is so of course the you, the debate is huge. Uh, one is your research uh, on society and the confrontations that you, you are uh, meeting from the society in general mm -hmm. and then of course it's inside the academia that's another thing mm -hmm. and I think that inside academia it's more um, of uh, implicit uh, aggression and uh, I think this only if you go into more if you go into debates and you participate in debates that's where you're going to face more harassment. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually going to start up a project where we're going to look into political harassment, <laughs> <laughs> political violence, and even in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um, but I do think there is a thing that if you actually stand out and talk in the media, then some, that something happens. Mm -hmm. And I can see that for my sake, I've been studying more um, gender inequalities in other countries than in mm -hmm. Africa, and people accept that. You know, mm -hmm. it's okay for me to go out and say, there is gender equality in Africa. Mm. But of course, it's more problematic for me to say it's mm. gender inequality in Norway. Mm. And uh, if I go into a public debate, there's more likely to be pushbacks uh, if I say that something is going on in Norway. Mm. So, um, yeah. Mm. Very important point. We have it's a question to from, uh, yeah. from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ida Elisa. I'm a student at Comparative Politics, master student. And I just wanted to continue a bit on something that Lisa mentioned about students and especially uh, we female students about what we can do in an earlier stage to get more women up and also to speak up for ourselves and mm -hmm. also facilitate. And I can completely confirm that we have felt this gendered structures also in class. For example, I had this experience uh, in a class where I was really participating and I was so active and I took the word all the times. And then after class, the male professor didn't even recognize my face. Yeah, yeah. He was like, who are you? Are you a bachelor student or mm. what are you doing here? Mm. Because I went to his office to ask a question. Mm. So, and of course that didn't uh, encourage me to continue being so active, but I did anyway. <laughs> but what do you think we can do both in the university but also among our students to promote uh, the females and also opening up the discussion for more different voices than just like the five males that are super active all the time? Thank you. I think that was a beautiful summing up of the important <laughs> issues in our panel. And I will let all the panelists answer it. And we we're approaching our end of, uh, end of the period. So if we could. So you respond to these? I can start with this is one of my pet subjects, you know, and, and you didn't mention the five men who were kind of doing all the talk. So I want to say to you, it's not the five men that's the problem. 
it's a either it's either the rest of you who lets these guys monopolize <laughs> because you don't take the word or it could be the you know the teacher who's you know not giving the word to everyone so that's a possibility but in my i always say don't tell me that the one guy in the front row is monopolizing because he's the only one who's engaging with me in a dialogue so i mean if if he's this guy is irritating you come on come on because i'm inviting you for a dialogue and you know if you don't want to dance he's going to dance with me so that's my first point you know just go in there and and take take the space if you feel like the door is slapped in your face like that experience you had first of all it's impossible it's impossible not to sort of personalize it because i mean i think all of us have had that feeling and you feel vulnerable you feel exposed and you feel belittled and you wonder you know if you do i have a right to be here in a sense mm -hmm. i think the only thing i can tell you is that i think every one of us has had this kind of a feeling and the only thing i really can say is share it talk to you know go back to Lindstrom, you know talk about it because it it just makes like and if there's anything this film taught me, it just helps to have, you know, you need, you need your network of affection in the sense, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need, you need a group and you need to sort of air these things with other people, not least to gain a vocabulary to talk about these gendered experiences, because I'm sure it's gendered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's two very sort of, <laughs> kind of underground advice, but, uh, and just know that you're not you're not the only one who's experienced this. <laughs> yeah, I mm. there just gonna touch on some points. I mean, thanks for sharing that, mm. first of all, mm. right? Because we need to hear these stories mm. and and get this is the role playing and muscle building. What should we do in that situation? Mm. In my opinion, social media is our friend these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, social media is how you can see, I mean, these um these wonderful women, uh, Jane and Rochelle, uh, are on Twitter. <laughs> Rachel tweets like 10 tweets a day. <laughs> and some of them um, are really insightful um, aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, so use each other, because there is mm -hmm. a critical mass out there. Mm -hmm. Hashtag women in STEM is mm -hmm. great. I'm using hashtag gender act when, when there's little tidbits of like information that I want to use and kind of uh, categorize mm -hmm. for our project. Um, and then I just want to point out something. I mean, this is my own bias. You guys realize what I what I did five minutes ago. I was, you know, brought up Dr. Jill Biden without even mentioning Kamala Harris as our first female vice president with African American and Southeast Asian roots. That's my white female PhD bias right there for you, right? So that this is it's nobody is perfect. I thought you were saving that for the next. One. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I realize that. I mean, that is a. I mean, that is way bit bigger <laughs> than Dr. Joe Biden, if you look at it. Um, Jennifer Eberhardt, who is a social psychologist at Stanford, wrote a book called Bias. Um, she's a black uh, professor at Stanford. I got to get Jane Willenbrink to talk to um, Jennifer Eberhardt. She hasn't check your own implicit bias, and then ask your professors to check theirs. <laughs> and we can spread this around mm -hmm. campus in a very nice way. This is facts, this is mm -hmm. human nature, this is science, this is humans. Um, science doesn't do itself, people do science. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing. And I think that we all had similar experiences uh, of some sort, uh, I would, have liked to, and, and it's also a story about uh, being seen and why doesn't uh, the professor see you? Why doesn't he recognize you? It could have been a woman, of course. Uh, and it would have been, I would have liked to have an answer of what to do. Uh, I guess the bias needs to be brought forward to them, but um, at least the most important thing is to just continue knocking on doors, uh, continue insisting on being seen. And uh, also, if you have one thing is to go back to the to back to your friends and talk about it, but also try to, uh, you know, be this group of people that is promoting each other. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So actually, when you are in class, you can have uh, another person, uh, one of your fellow students who could say, so uh, as a Elisa, you know, bringing bringing attention mm -hmm. to your name mm -hmm. and to each other mm -hmm. uh, to make and then it will maybe recognize uh, mm -hmm you easier because I think that that's a really important thing to do yeah. is to kind of talk each other up yeah. uh, and also 
uh, mentioning it, each other names uh, and things like that and try but I think it's really important and this was also at least a study mm. some years back you mm. know that you need to be active and, and, and talk but also talk try to um, uh, make sure that you you use name and uh, and talk each other up mm. I think that's important Thanks a lot to all of you. We have gone uh, five, six minutes over our time, which is uh, not a lot, but it's still six minutes. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank very much uh, Lisa, Dorothy and Ragnar for, uh, for being here on stage and sharing their fantastic insights with uh, all of us. I want to thank our physical audience for being here and actually asking questions <laughs> and our digital audience that I think Yay. is out there I don't think it was, <laughs> I don't think it was a bot that question, but I'm very happy for that um, I've learned a lot I've learned that we need to group up mm. and collectify I've learned that we need to confront and speak up I've learned that we need to retain critical thought as a kind of a, a basis I need I've learned that we need to diversify and celebrate diversity and I've learned that we need to document the kind of uh, acts of discrimination. So I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. So thank you all of you. Thank you. Thank you.